It was Monday evening, almost 8.30 p.m. After spending the entire day working on a project in my home office that still required significant effort, I finally wrapped up my tasks. I stepped into the dimly lit kitchen and opened the refrigerator, pulling out my favorite light beer. As I took a sip, I gazed out the kitchen window and spotted Joy curled up on the couch in our backyard, next to the campfire by the pool. She sat cross-legged in the corner, animatedly chatting on her cell phone. I contemplated joining her, but paused when I noticed her absently twirling a strand of her blonde hair with the finger of her right hand. This familiar gesture had been a hallmark of our conversations for almost thirty years. I recognized it as an unconscious habit that I found endearing. It was more than just a quirk. Over the decades, I began to see it as a manifestation of our deep spiritual connection. Whenever we felt closest, she would twist her hair in that way. In the earlier years, when I often traveled for business, I would call home every night to talk with Joy and our children. During those conversations, I would picture her sitting there, twisting her hair as we spoke. That thought brought me comfort during lonely nights away, making the distance feel a little more bearable. As I continued to watch Joy through the window, she smiled and laughed at something on the other end of the line. A pang of jealousy shot through me as I realized I was witnessing a moment that felt more intimate than I expected. Although she was too far away for me to see the familiar twinkle in her eyes, I sensed it was there. She appeared entirely at ease, radiating warmth and joy while still twisting her hair, a sight that made my heart swell with pride and pain. After watching her for what felt like an eternity, I finally realized I had been standing there for almost forty-five minutes, observing my wife as she engaged in a secretive conversation with someone else. The dreamy smile that appeared on her lips when the call ended cut me deeply. I turned away, feeling trapped in a painful trance, and walked into the living room to watch the local baseball team play on TV. Eventually, Joy returned inside. When she noticed me sitting alone, she asked, How long have you been finished with your work? Why didn't you come to the backyard? I responded, You were on the phone, and I didn't want to interrupt. Oh! For God's sake, I was talking to Steve. We'd been making some decisions regarding Philip's account. I focused on the game, avoiding her probing gaze that seemed to try to pierce through me. Joy moved into the kitchen, only to return moments later with a glass of wine. She sat on the edge of the sofa next to my chair and inquired, What's the bills? I have no idea, I replied absentmindedly. Joy chuckled. Do you even know who the Sox are playing against? It's the Blue Jays, I muttered, still fixated on the game. We continued to watch until the game went to a commercial break. Joy then resumed her one-sided conversation, suggesting we invite the kids over for a barbecue on Saturday. I agreed, but she dominated the dialogue, bringing up various topics until she paused and asked, Chris, what happened? You're not talking much today. It's not like you. I have a lot on my mind, I replied tersely. Is there anything you'd like to talk about? She pressed. No, I said, and a heavy silence enveloped us for a time. When the commercial break ended, Joy suddenly jumped up, pulling a blue v-neck t-shirt over her head with an effortless motion. She stood before me in brown shorts, a bright smile on her face as she offered. How about you turn off the TV and meet me upstairs? I'm sure I can help you work through your stress. I looked into her eyes my heart heavy. What didn't you understand about I'm not in the mood today? Her smile widened as she reached between my legs, teasingly cupping my crotch. Come on, big boy. Mom needs you. The frustration boiled inside me. What the hell is wrong with you? I'm just trying to be nice, she protested, her expression shifting as she seemed to take my rejection personally. You refuse to love me at least twice a week. If I refuse you once a year, will you whimper like a four-year-old? Grow up and leave me alone. If her gaze could have killed, I felt like I would have turned into a piece of overcooked pork. She shot me a disgusted look, then stormed out of the room, her anger palpable. For the first time in our marriage, I found myself sleeping in the guest room that night. I lay there, 
planning my next moves, and when the clock in the bedroom showed 3 a.m., I realized it was futile to stay in bed. I got up, took a shower in the old children's bathroom, and snuck into the master bedroom to retrieve my clothes, determined to move forward. After leaving for work, I took the step of downloading a tracking app for both Joy's personal and work phones. I synchronized these devices with my laptop and iPhone to monitor her movements closely. Armed with two large cups of Dunkin' Donuts coffee and a throbbing headache, I sailed into my day, which surprisingly turned out to be quite productive. It was crucial for me to finalize my presentation before leaving early the next morning for a short two-day business trip. On Tuesday evening, I returned home to a noticeably cold atmosphere. As I lay in bed, there was minimal conversation between Joy and me, and the intimacy we once shared felt completely absent. The following morning, I left the house early again, but this time my destination was the airport for a 7.20 a.m. flight. Wednesday afternoon was filled with productive negotiations with our client, where I successfully secured several key points. I felt confident that I would be returning home with a signed contract. Throughout the day, I regularly checked the tracking app to monitor Joy's location. To my relief, she was either at home or at work. However, a nagging suspicion lingered within me. Deep down, I believed that Joy was having an affair. Later that evening, I dined at the restaurant in my married hotel. At 7.30 p.m., I checked the tracking app again and noticed that Joy was at a different location, a prestigious address just a few miles from our house. It turned out that she was at the home of her boss, Steve. That night, she stayed with him, and the next morning, she went straight to work from his place. The following months were filled with stress, but they passed surprisingly quickly. While we were still living together, Joy attempted to work her way back into my good graces. I maintained a pleasant demeanor and avoided confrontation, but I kept my emotional distance. Our intimate moments felt purely functional, a stark contrast to our previous connection. As I discovered more about Joy's affair, I learned that she only engaged with Steve while I was away on business trips. After my second trip, I decided to take measures to uncover the truth. I installed four video cameras throughout our house, in the kitchen, living room, guest room, and master bedroom. However, the only information I gleaned from the footage was that Joy was packing enough clothes to stay at Steve's place for the entire duration of my trips. Following the advice of our company's lawyer, I sought a family law attorney. Since our children were grown and living independently, the divorce process would be a straightforward 50-50 split. Although it was uncertain whether a private investigator could gather evidence without invading Steve's privacy, I was advised to hire one anyway to document Joy's living conditions while I was out of town. Despite my initial doubts, the private investigator uncovered shocking evidence. He discovered that Joy and Steve often made love outdoors in his secluded backyard. The investigator captured explicit photographs of them, including one memorable image of Steve while Joy sat on the edge of his pool. I now possessed a collection of images that illustrated Joy's betrayal in vivid detail. It was time to take action. I informed Joy that I had another business trip planned, telling only my boss and personal assistant. I left for the city early on Wednesday morning and had breakfast before returning home after the tracking app indicated that Joy had left for work. Over the next two days, I meticulously packed and sealed cardboard boxes filled with everything that belonged to Joy. Friday morning was designated as D-Day, but I first needed to make three incredibly challenging phone calls. Our three children, aged between 22 and 27, were all successful in their respective careers. The youngest, a daughter, had recently graduated from college and was working as a kindergarten teacher while our two eldest sons had also completed their degrees and were employed in their fields. The conversations I had with each of them were strikingly similar, filled with a grotesque blend of emotions. I cried during each call, expressing my love for them while conveying my decision to divorce their mother. Each child reacted with disbelief, telling me I was overreacting. In response, I asked if they wanted me to send them the incriminating video of their mother with her lover in his backyard. Each of them promptly refused the offer, 
a testament to their discomfort with the situation. The mood shifted when I made the fourth call. Hi, Chris. This is an unexpected surprise. How are your meetings going? I greeted him warmly. He replied, Hello, my love. Meetings are just meetings. You know how it is. How's your job? He added, I'm so glad it's Friday because I can't wait for you to come home. It's been a long, lonely week. I hope we can reconnect a little over the weekend. At that moment, I noticed that Joy had avoided answering my question about her work, which only deepened my suspicions about what she had been up to during my absence. Christopher Harrington was on the phone with Joy, his wife. Despite her recent destructive behavior and lies, he could still sense the urgency and care in her voice. Their conversation began with Joy asking, What do I owe the pleasure of your call? Christopher replied, I have a question for you. It was an odd question, but it was important because Joy rarely called him during business hours. Do you like my smile? he asked. Joy's response was immediate and somewhat defensive. She reminded him that it was the first thing she told him when they met at a student party. How much she liked to smile. However, the tension in her voice indicated something deeper was troubling her. Christopher's heart ached as he thought about the love they once shared. He had tried hard to maintain a positive atmosphere at home, focusing on their three children and the love of his life. Despite the difficulties, he wanted their family to thrive. As their conversation continued, Joy reassured him of her feelings, expressing her admiration for his smile and positive attitude. Yet, Christopher felt overwhelmed by the reality of their situation. Tears streamed down his face as he struggled to articulate the pain he felt inside. He knew that despite Joy's assurances, their relationship was in serious trouble. I'm not sure that someday I'll smile at you again, he finally confessed, counting the seconds as the gravity of his words hung in the air. Joy, sensing the impending heartbreak, pleaded with him to explain what was happening. You're scaring me, Chris. Please talk to me, she begged. Despite the love in her voice, he couldn't shake the feeling of betrayal. It's too late for us to talk, he replied firmly. He acknowledged that their discussions should be based on love, trust, and respect, but he felt that all of that had eroded. Joy, you've done too much damage, he continued. I know you love me, and I love you too, but I don't trust you anymore. Joy started to protest, but Christopher interrupted her. I can't respect you anymore. His voice dripped with contempt as he commanded her to come to the living room window. The amusement he felt turned dark as he watched her realization dawn on her face. She was standing next to a man he knew was Steve Miller, her lover and boss. Christopher was about 75 feet away, standing next to a U-Haul van filled with Joy's belongings. He had spent two days meticulously packing everything into 48 large cardboard boxes. As Joy and Steve approached the window, he jumped into the cab of the van put it in reverse, and slammed on the accelerator. The van rolled backward, gaining speed as he neared the large turnaround area in front of Steve's house. He slammed on the brakes, causing all of Joy's possessions to spill out of the back of the van and scatter across the driveway and lawn. After shifting the van into park, Christopher stepped outside to assess the chaos he had created. The lighter boxes of clothes remained relatively intact, but the heavier boxes including ones containing family heirlooms, were crushed. Joy watched in horror from the porch, her face pale as she realized the extent of what was happening. At that moment, a lawyer's assistant emerged from a car parked next to Joy's Mercedes SUV. He approached them, handed Joy a large yellow envelope and stated, Joy Harrington, you are served. He then took a picture of her before turning to Steve and delivering a similar envelope with the same message. Both of them stood frozen, unable to comprehend the situation. Christopher contemplated leaving without saying another word, but ultimately decided he wanted to confront them one last time. He shouted, at the very least, I hope we can all agree that I deserve better than a lying, cheating woman instead of a wife. Joy screamed in disbelief. But Christopher continued, Steve, call my lawyer and make a very, very generous offer or I will do everything I can to destroy you and your firm. Joy, just sign the papers. I'm done. With that, he turned away, 
climbed back into the van and drove off, leaving Joy and Steve to face the fallout of their actions.